Go, baby, go. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 321, I am very lucky, privileged to have Annie uh, Margarita Yang on the podcast. She is a YouTuber, best-selling author, and her go-getter, I'm going to say as well. How are you today, my lady? I'm doing quite wonderful. It's Friday today, so I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, she just basically wants to get off this podcast and, yeah, like go to the land of Nod, sleeping left, right, and center. I don't blame her. She works hard. She works hard. <laughs> I put in the hours for sure. <laughs> oh, no, I feel you. I feel you. Yes, I have to ask. Now, you are, well, how can I put it? You are a lady who is moving, going places. How did you get your start with everything? What led you to? What was the catalyst for you to get your butt into gear, as they say? Oh, man, I didn't have a good starting point. I, I'm i actually born in the United States, in Brooklyn, New York, and my parents are immigrants from China. So we didn't have a lot of money growing up. And But I did have like straight A's all throughout K to 12. And I didn't go straight to college. I worked a whole string of minimum wage jobs. And then... I eventually got an online degree in communications, but coming mm -hmm. out, I was working at Domino's Pizza. So that was my start. The catalyst to me, you know, being where I am today is when my husband and I, we moved to Boston, I said, I'm going to make a different life for us. I want to be successful. I want to leave my mark on this world and I want my name to be known and I want to make a difference. So I'm not going to care what people think. I'm just going to do what I want to do. <laughs> right. So I always wanted to work in something maybe like accounting, something financial related, because I like managing money for our own household, like earning a low income. We had to really work with a very tight budget. I looked at every penny. You know, if, if some vendor, a store charged me too much for sales tax, I would flip. Right. So <laughs> so if, I, uh, if I'm that good with our own money, I was like, OK, maybe I can work for a business that does this. So that's how I got my start. I I applied to 50 accounting jobs a day without an accounting degree, and I got a job in a week, basically. In a week. Yeah. My God, if, like 50 accounting jobs every day. Now, this is the thing. Like, OK. There are some people which would like go listen to that and go, what? That is a bit mental. Accounting, like accounting, uh, just basically applying for 50 jobs. Uh, like how? What level did you aim for to get these jobs? Was it a case of you went in low to get your foot in the door? Or was it a case of like you went, hey, look, look, I have a certain set of skills and I think this will pay uh, the bills for myself and you what did you do where did you go i i didn't care what the job was i actually before i was applying to accounting jobs i was applying to customer service jobs i was applying to like jobs that involved answering the phone and somebody told me you're not qualified to answer phones and then i was like what what do you mean i'm not qualified to answer phones i worked at domino's pizza answering phone calls for a year taking people's orders on a phone and she was like insulting me saying my phone skills needed work I was like I don't know what you're talking about you know so I was like you know if, if I can't even work in customer service what job can I get <laughs> in customer oh, service no. so at that point that's when I transitioned and I was like you know what I'm just gonna go for accounting like what what's the point if I'm not even qualified to work customer service of all jobs it's <laughs> like <laughs> 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 what see what but like this is the thing like okay look don't get me wrong like I work in Domino's and I, I would say a whole litter of like sort of like, yeah, minimum wage jobs where look, let's just say uh, the customer facing roles in the world are not the easiest. They are like in many respects uh, how you get sort of battle tested, battle hardened, if you get what I mean. Uh, so for you to be like, what? Ha. Huh. So would you describe yourself? as a tough person, a tough individual? Today, I can honestly say that, but 
Uh, mm. When I first started out, no, I was a big crybaby. I had really thin skin. Uh, when my husband and I first got married, I was 21 years old. I moved in with him. Um, I moved all the way from New York City to Texas to the, like the middle of nowhere to be with this guy. And I, I told him when I got there, I was like, you know what? I'm from New York. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Right. And so to I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I got there, I applied for some jobs and then, um, within not even 24 hours, the bank that I applied to just said rejected. And, and I was like, I went crazy. You know, my mind, I went like, I was crying for two whole days. I was like telling my husband, they rejected me. And then he was like, you're so weak. <laughs> oh my Lord. Oh my God. <laughs> so I, know it's like, I know what it's like to be rejected and to have your feelings hurt. I, I'm, I take it a lot better today. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. But Okay, like this is the thing, just just from the small snippet of that story, like, okay, okay, you go, yeah, I found a guy, I'm in love, he lives in Texas. Like you go, okay, if you're in Texas, that's not a problem. But New York to Texas, how? <laughs> it's like, and you're like going, yep, I'm off at 21. <laughs> like, that's like, okay, you... You may not have been the strongest, but like bold, and to say you got some like big kahunas is to definitely to say, yeah, taking a chance like that. Well, the thing is, uh, a lot of the things I got myself into, I didn't know what to expect. So I didn't know how hard it would be to move somewhere new and then like make a transition, like basically leave everything behind and have a new social circle with no job lined up. <laughs> I had no idea how hard that was. So when you don't know, you kind of just, step into it right <laughs> yeah that's everything that i've done like nobody has told me that what i want to do is hard and because i never had the expectation that it was hard i kind of just start doing it you know ah indeed <laughs> truly fearless truly fearless so okay so when you made that glorious uh declaration that you wanted to be known for something did you have an idea of what you wanted to be known for? Or was it a case of, hey, <laughs> I want to be known for something. Did you like write it down or were you just like, okay, I just wanted to be known for something. How did you get to where that is clear? I Person really, I really like this guy. His name's Dave Ramsey. He helps people stop living paycheck to paycheck and to pay off their debts. I was inspired by him. So I wanted to help people at least in some form with their finances. Mm. So I knew for a fact something related to finances, but these days actually there's been a shift in me as I've made more money. I've actually like cared less about my own finances and started for some reason, I don't know why, maybe it's just part of growing older. I started caring more about social issues, um, like real economic issues in our society. So I, I'm actually even shifting away from finances i want to be more known more than just for finances like i see i go into the downtown area of boston and i see like 25 percent of the stores are closed like mm. not just closed but like vacant they vacated right and the downtown is just like a shadow of what i it was like five years ago when i first moved here i mean no one's shopping there you know and and when i see stuff like this I'm just like, what happened? I want to do something about it. I want to like maybe um, interview people who are in that area and, and showcase what their thoughts are so we can so start solving this problem and make the downtown vibrant again, right? Like I'm starting to care about things like this as well. Ah, so like, okay. So you want to transition into doing social things and like basically like, yeah, work out how you can regenerate the downtown area of uh boston this sounds like you're maybe doing a like a run for office maybe in the near future i and now i have no plans to run for office because i i think the government is very corrupt and oh, yeah. and when i shine a light on the corruption people will hate me and you know oh. i i don't do anything wrong i just shine a light on the corruption but people hate being exposed and stuff like that so um, I don't want to run for office because there's also like a lot of bureaucracy. You have to deal mm. with people who who will undermine you as well. But I think I'd rather um, 
I want to do something more like propaganda related to get people to get off their butt and start taking action and helping out with changing the city for the better. Right. Yeah. Mm. Love. It's almost like because here, here in the United States, the American Revolution it was actually started in Boston, like the movers and shakers that <laughs> fought, uh, fought against uh, England. Uh, yeah. well, all, I, all I've got to say, you treacherous mob. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're the ones who throw the tea, threw the tea into the harbor. So, <laughs> you know what? I will go to the kitchen and throw some tea bags at this camera. I guess I yes, build the repression. There you go. <laughs> Oh, I love it. So, like, this is the thing, like, helping, like, motivate people in a community, which, okay, look, uh, the high street in many regards, like, or downtown, has been kind of under fire for, I would say, globally for a good whew, 15, 20 years. Like, you know, the stronger internet purchases get, the more the high street suffers. And, yeah, with the rise, well, with the rise of a certain pathogen, uh, one COVID, that sort of like like sped things up quite considerably. Uh, trying to get people back into downtown, trying to get them back into the offices, like that is a very big task, to say the least. I'm not saying you're not up, like you won't be able to do it. I'm just saying it's a mammoth task. Well, I can see how the city doesn't encourage it. I mean, I see all the parking tickets they give out. It doesn't encourage me to drive into downtown, you know? Why, you know, if, if a parking area in a downtown with, at a meter is only two hours, what yeah. can I do in two hours? Can I shop and eat? I can only eat, right? And then maybe quickly buy something. I don't have time to like stroll around all day, entering all the shops, checking things out, browsing and, and shopping, you know? Um, but that's the policy we have here in Boston. I see that. And then I also see parking tickets like all over the place. I mean, I kind of I actually think it discourages people from driving in and shopping. I think they want to encourage people to take public transit in. But it also discourages like so many people like me. I don't live in Boston. So how do mm. I take the public transit in to go shopping? I can't. Right. So it dis it discourages people from outside to come in to shop which isn't sustainable. If, if it's a downtown area, it needs people from all over to come in. Um, it discourages uh, people with families, children who have mm -hmm. strollers. You know, they cannot walk themselves. It discourages elderly people as well from shopping. They have money, but they are just, you know, physically unable. You know, it doesn't help if they have to take public transit. So it basically discourages like a whole host of people, but they're encouraging only bicyclists. They add, bi they remove spots and then they replace them with bike lanes. But like, what can you carry with a bike lane? I saw the, like a lot of the shops they've closed because like, can you carry like, I don't know, a guitar on your bike? If I want to go into downtown to a guitar center and buy a $500 guitar, which, you know, the city also makes an income tax off of when it's sold along with sales tax, it's sales tax revenue for the city, but they've gotten rid of like parking spots and, and turned everything into one lane instead of two and replaced it with a bike lane. Can I carry that on my bike no you know so it really they their policies have discouraged people from coming into shops so i see things like this i care um maybe it's just another aspect i care about finances but maybe i'm just caring more about like business owners finances now as well in that regard oh. mm -hmm. no, it definitely sounds like your plan to run for office i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> just saying that uh, uh, yeah um because like this is the thing, like you speak very passionately about, yeah, the sort of plight of the downtown Boston area. And yeah, with regards to like the introduction of cycle lanes, like yeah, increased ticketing and basically losing parking spots and sort of trying to galvanize everything to public transport, which like, okay, I've been to the states on the east coast um mostly new york i have visited the great city of boston but it's a place which are not it's not really sort of geared to public transport if you get what i mean yeah it's not so, so it's like i find it a very sort of tough ask um but it seems like with all of these things all of these areas you need to talk like you're talking about it definitely sounds like yes um city council or yeah city council or higher is definitely where you sort of be like coordinating with 
like are you planning to sort of like speak to like yeah councillors or is it just local community leaders who want to speak to you? No, so I, I wanna I wanna speak to everyone. My husband pushed me. He's he's an anthropologist and he said, Annie, you can't already come in with an opinion. You if you actually want to solve a problem, you have to interview everyone. You have to get all sides of the story, not just what you think is the source of the problem. I think, for my opinion, is what I just described, but it could be more than just that, right? So he told me I have to interview, like, you know, the landlords, the shop owners, the people who are in charge of, like, the retail association, the city council, like, get everyone's side, right, to really see what the source of the problem is because we see the government enacting policies, but how can a government enact a policy that will solve a problem once and for all when they don't even understand the problem itself? Mm. Yeah, I think with regards to the problem and on the sort of greater scale of things, uh, like the thing what's affecting like many of the sort of sort of city districts over here in the UK, um, before COVID, like they like we were kind of moving towards like yeah, working from home and like being in the office. COVID basically sped everything up by oh maybe five or 10 years, 10 years, definitely. Um, but like, yeah, I go into the office because of where my office is located, I go in once a week. And then much of my team goes in twice a week. Uh, but other like, companies go do three times a week going in. But that's kind of the thing because that footfall, that mass of people now are elsewhere. Plus it's a case of, you're not buying lunches or like this and like you can rearrange your time to be at home right like rather than having to go to a shop after work and everything like this it's kind of killed off it's killing off our sort of city centers slowly but surely there's some places which have not come back uh, but that is just one part of it and with regards to the rise of the raising of sort of like um rental properties for like shops, the business rates and that have gone up sky high. So it's like, it's a many different factors. And like, yeah, I think it's going to be a very interesting journey uh, for you uh, to figure this out um, along the way. You might see something which is completely different. I'll be interested to see like your perspective now, if that will be the same in a year's time two years time yeah I'm, I'm interested as well because like i i don't know i saw the downtown area a month ago and when i went i was like oh my god if i didn't know this was boston i think this was san francisco <laughs> you know oh. i'm i i see these videos on youtube of like san francisco and the crime and stuff like that i literally would have thought this was san francisco but no it's boston and then i was like it, i was really, like really taken aback and then, you know, I, I, I saw homeless people, I saw drug addicts on the street. And then I was like, we also have a drug problem here in Boston. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even sure. And then I realized, yeah, because we have so many hospitals here and we do a lot of treatment, you know, for surgeries and stuff like that. People need painkillers when they're done, yeah. you know, and that can increase the risk for um, someone to develop an addiction to opioids as well. So I like, this is just like a whole, whole host of problems, but like in regards to like why people stop shopping, yeah, maybe that's the killer of the downtown area. But like we have other areas that have been developing, like here in Boston, the greater Boston area. Um, mm -hmm. We have like shopping centers that have been developed called like Assembly Row District. And there's also South Bay Mall. And like they have so much free parking, like they literally have the parking lots and um, parking garages as well. And it's free, you know, for like one of them is free all day. You just drive in, you get a ticket, you use the same ticket going out. You don't have to pay anything. The other one is like free for three hours. And then if you stay a little more than that, you know, you pay by the hour, but it's still cheap. Like if I was there for five hours, I pay only $5, right? And then like, like all the shops um, are, are renting there instead. They're not going to downtown. They're choosing to rent there because that's where people are going shopping. You know, mm. that's where I enjoy shopping. <laughs> <laughs> because it's easy for me to to park there and then I have everything that I need. They even have a grocery store there. So, I mean, why not? You know, why would why would I want to go into the downtown area? There's no incentive for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. Like, uh, no, like, 
with regards to like in a lot of things, like when you say San Francisco, like San Francisco with its issues and everything like this, one of the things which they got like you hear, I like I hear as an outsider is there's nothing they can do to change things in San Francisco. But when there was that summit, I think it was COP28, I might be wrong about that, which was there about, oh, just just under a month ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They swept the streets up. They cleaned everything up. Oh. The homeless was like, gone. They kicked the homeless away for a week. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> if you could do that, then that means you could do it all the time. It's just you choose not to. So that's one of those things where I'm like, I look in, I'm looking a little bit dubious, a little bit sus about that. But, you know, that um, it, that San Francisco, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting on any high horse like over here in the UK. We've got <laughs> our own issues as well. But, you know, <laughs> now, one of the things, like just a change in pivot. Yeah, I was looking on your YouTube channel. And like, yeah, you talked about like, yeah, saving 10 grand on a minimum wage job. Like, there's going to be many a person who ask like, yeah, I'm trying to get my start. I'm trying to get things moving uh, with regards to, hey, who knows, studying, getting a new place or like basically maybe starting their own business. But they need that sort of working capital. How would you like, being an expert saver that you are, mm, like, how would you tell people to get started with that? But which part? Those are all different goals, you know, just the saving money part. But what are you saving for? Right? Mm. Like, the starting a business thing comes after. It's not something you do when you have no money and you're just starting out with nothing saved up. That's something you do, I feel like, when once you feel more secure in your finances, no? Like, because if you are desperate and then you are able to get a loan and it doesn't work out you are not going to think straight and then you're going to go out of business right that's my mentality toward it um i i meet business owners that are okay with debt i personally i don't like it like i because i'm really conservative right like i i i hate risk so i take as little risk as possible just to make sure i will succeed though right so if i if i have to be slow and steady to build something that that will grow into something big, I will take the slow and steady route. I'm not going to go quick, you know? So the way I've always done things is like, even from back then when I was saving my money on like a minimum wage, whatever I did save, I also set aside some of that savings toward in, um, toward educating myself or for something that would be better for my career so that I can make more money in my career and then, you know, take more of that, put it back in put it back in so like for example in the beginning one of the things that i did was yeah i spent money on a website that's a small expense but for me back then on that income that was a lot you know i had to pay for the domain and the hosting and things like that that was my first start um later on for example uh when i moved to boston and then i said i'm gonna make my mark one of the first things i said is i need a headshot i need a nice looking headshot to show online um so that people recognize me but that was six hundred dollars for me that was a lot you know uh, so I had to actually save for four months to afford that, you know, 150 a month over the course mm-hmm. of four months. And then I booked the appointment to get the headshot. Right. So I, I did things like really slowly. You know, um, once I got an even better paying job, the next thing I said to myself was like, OK, I need to invest in my appearance. If I want to be someone who's influential, I need to look the part as well. Right. And, and when the kind of Annie I looked at in the mirror staring back at me, I was like, I still look like a teenager. I feel like I've never grown up or something, you know? It's, it's weird because I, I was a woman, but uh, I didn't feel like I was a woman yet. Um, and it, it also doesn't help that I'm Asian, so I look young for my age too. So I paid, I, I took the more, I made more money. I took that money and I paid for an image consultant to teach me how I can dress to look my best, like what colors look good on me, what kind of clothes would look good on me as well, because I couldn't figure it out from just reading books. I actually needed the personal help, right? Then after that, I invested in like a makeup artist. I I was watching YouTube videos and yes, there's like a lot of free videos out there, but I couldn't figure out how to do it on my eyes. You know, like I was trying and it just couldn't make it look nice because technique matters and everyone's face is different. So it might look good on another YouTuber, but it doesn't look good on me. So I had to pay a makeup artist for personal private lessons to teach me, you know? So like 
all these things, as I made more money, I had to invest along the way, which, you know, eventually did also help me make more money, <laughs> right? But it, it took time and, and I'm okay with things being like slow one at a time because I feel like the, the more money you borrow to grow quickly, the faster you will lose it all as well. And I want something that will stay for like maybe 300 years. Mm -hmm. I see, 300 years. You are truly a disciple of Dave Ramsey, uh, to say the least. Uh, yeah, because uh, yes, he's a man who does not like uh, any form of debt whatsoever. But like, you bring up an interesting point because like, yes, you're doing the slow moves, building, like building up a like firm, strong base, laying deep foundations. But I like the fact that you were like, yeah, okay, I had like, I, appearances like appearance in this day and age uh when you just come across someone's profile means a lot people are like oh no it doesn't mean anything no it means a lot it like basically presentation is king and if you like present poorly that could be physically how you talk or anything like this it will hurt you eventually uh in the long run um like basically paying for the headshots and then basically getting someone to consult with how you dress and how you appear because let's just say um the world since 2020 like has become a lot more relaxed on sort of like many a thing like getting that sort of look right what like what surprised you about when people like when you went to this image consultant? What what did they say, which was like, oh, I didn't think of that, or I didn't see that. Oh, she taught me this. It's called the fashion fit formula, but it's specifically for women. There is a fashion fit formula for men, but the clothing is more for like formal wear, not casual mm -hmm. wear. Uh, but this formula basically tells you everything. Where that should hit like different points of your body vertical wise that will make it look like everything is so polished about you, right? So that way, when you wear clothes that you buy off the rack, why does it look so frumpy? Even though it looks stylish, it kind of like looks frumpy. The reason is because it's not tailored to your proportions, your vertical proportions. So she was telling me things like your three quarter sleeves need to end one inch below your elbow. <laughs> or like your necklace needs to be, um, needs to hit one inch below your breastbone. <laughs> uh what was it like a three-quarter length um oh no a mid-length skirt needs to hit like i don't know three inches below your knee like exact points where my clothes need to hit so once i knew those points every mm -hmm. time i bought clothes off the rack um most of the cl clothes i bought were second hand so i could save money i would take those clothes to the tailor and i would ask her to tailor it to to hit exactly those points and I started getting compliments everywhere I went. You know, people were always telling me, oh my gosh, you're always so put together. Like people were like giving me double takes. People were nicer to me, started smiling at me more. Random strangers would, um, I would go to Home Depot and people would compliment me. You know, you look great. That color looks amazing on you. And and honestly, it's it's also been a big boost for my confidence to see that kind of reaction from people. Yeah, yeah. I see. So basically, it's just yeah these like these little things these little markers like she's told you it's just made you like how can i say pop in the eyes of people you like meet like yeah colleagues and strangers so yeah so with that do you feel it's giving you like when it comes to like your higher up say at work or anything like that they like notice you more now yeah that? um th there's that as well like one of my clients, my client is, eight, I have a client, he's 82 years old. No, he's 83 years old now. He had a birthday. Um, oh. And and then at some point we had a meeting and he's like, you know, you always look so well-dressed. Has anyone ever told you that you're very, very stylish? <laughs> he, and he said, I wasn't sure if it was appropriate for me to tell you that. <laughs> and then I was like, well, thanks. It's something I had to like work on so people are definitely noticing right i'm turning red right now because i'm a little embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> um so they do definitely notice and i i think it's a good thing because when you're well dressed people who are influential and powerful in, in our society if you can get into that circle they'd be happy to introduce you to their network and that's the important thing right 
being able to tap into other people's network. So um, I think that is quite important. It works. Mm -hmm. Outstanding, outstanding. So like, this is the thing, tapping into other people's networks, look, you like with your new well-presented self, uh, like, yeah, like your professional like setup, I really do like her like set up for podcasting. Believe you me, there are people out there, not good, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, and yeah, doing your YouTube channel. Like, yeah, what got you on to like going, yeah, YouTube? Because there are many avenues you could have taken, you know? Well, I have a, a more of a talent for spoken word rather than taking pictures. I feel like I can express a whole lot more via video than simply writing an article right mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot more entertaining more interesting so i went with youtube instead because i also had a public speaking background and i wanted to showcase my ability to speak more articulately online so that's why i went with youtube but it i mean like i always growing up because i grew up with youtube right i'm 28 now so youtube was around when i was a teenager and i would watch other people on youtube and i'd be like i want to do that i want to make videos, but I never had the confidence until uh, one day um, I was so angry because my husband, <laughs> you get this, get this. My husband was watching this video of really, really hot woman. Okay. And she was like giving student loan advice. She was talking about how she owed a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. And she has been trying to pay it off for several years, but she hasn't been able to, but then toward the middle of the video, she said that, oh yeah, I make like $12,000 a month. Yeah. I was like, if she makes 12,000 a month, she can pay off her student loans. If she did the Dave Ramsey plan, she can pay that off in like a year, maybe a year and a half, you know, really quickly. She's just stupid with her money, but she was like complaining about how how, oh, it's so hard for millennials to get ahead. Millennials will always be broke and living paycheck to paycheck. I get it, guys. I can relate. And like the comments were just saying like, oh my God, she's so hot. She's so hot, you know? And I was like, is no one listening to what she's saying? <laughs> she, 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 like, she, I, I, I was like, she doesn't deserve to have people listen to her because she's, her message was stupid, okay? And so that's why I made a YouTube video that that video you saw about like saving five grand, saving 10 grand on minimum wage. That was, that was what got me started because I saw that video. I was so pissed. I said, I need to do something about this because she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, you know what? I, 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 how can I put it? I, I like your diplomatic and calm <laughs> full fright answer. <laughs> No, no, I've got to say, yeah, look, with with regards to some people and when it comes to money and like, yeah, like 12 grand a month. Uh, yeah, if, if I was earning 12 grand a month, uh, I like, trust me, <laughs> uh, things would be so much easier. It, uh, yeah, uh, damn, live off free and just save the rest. <laughs> well, that's just, that's just, that, that's just me. Uh, that's not me being frugal. It's just, mm, yeah. <laughs> I think once you get part, no, <laughs> but like, yeah. So you, you looked upon this, like, how can I say hard set upon lady who was earning 12 grand, like, as you would say, not the brightest young lady in like, or this brightest star in heaven, as they say, <laughs> and you went, I could do better. Mm -hmm. So like, what was like, what was, so was the, the saving like saving 10 grand was your first video or was it a case of, did you just critique this lady and went, what the hell is she No, I, I never critiqued it. Nobody ever knew that that's the reason why I started making YouTube videos until I started getting on sh podcast shows and people were asking me, well, why did you start the YouTube channel? I'm like, you want to know why? Here's the truth. <laughs> but okay. aside from that, the videos are always just very informative of the subject okay. matter. <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, no, no. Like, it's all good. It's all good. So, like, this is the thing. Like, would you, would you say with regards to, like, yeah, how can I say your sort of financial, like, discipline, it sort of stems from, like, your parents? Because you have, a, like, your mom and dad had a very sort of interesting time 
at getting over to the States? Yeah, it it definitely helped. I think it came from my parents. It made it easier for me because growing up, I never saw them use a credit card. I had no idea what a credit card was at 18. Mm. Like when I saw the Dave Ramsey videos, I was like, what's a credit card? In fact, what's a debit card? What is that? You know, because my parents always used only cash. Everything was cash. They paid for everything with cash. And then we hardly ever ate out. Like I remember at 14, I got a boyfriend and my boyfriend took me to Code Stone Creamery and I, we went in and then I was like, I don't know how to order ice cream. How does this work? <laughs> like, do I pick a flavor? But then do I pick a cone? Do I get charged for the ice cream or the, for the cone? Like I couldn't figure out what it meant. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, because we only went out to eat for like break, um, not breakfast, for birthdays and for holidays. Yeah. Only for special occasions. Other than that, we always ate at home. So I was like really, really confused. <laughs> okay. My God. Because like this is the thing. The only reason why I asked, because one of the stories you told, like on another podcast, is like how your dad like came over to the States and like, you know what I mean? He was like battling to get your mother over here for a number of years. And yeah. Like he had to go to, was it Newark Airport? Oh yeah, 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 that story. Yeah, so they, my parents actually, they met in China, right? But then they got married in Australia for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know what was the whole backstory behind that. But my dad was already a citizen. So he had to go back to the States. And while th that happened for three years, my mom lived in Australia because she didn't have a green card yet. They had to wait for the green card to be processed. So they, mm. they were long distance for three years while they were waiting for this uh, paperwork from the government. Finally, she gets a green card. So she takes a flight to Newark Airport to move to the United States. He's late because he takes a bus from Brooklyn to Newark Airport in New Jersey. So it's a different state, first of all. Um, and, and that trip, when he was late, he brought flowers. And my mom told me that he never bought her flowers ever again. That's the only time in her life he ever bought her flowers. And they both my mom and dad had to take the bus back home after he picked her up from the airport <laughs> yeah yes, okay. so he but, can't um, even afford the taxi basically <laughs> yeah so it's like hey welcome to america ah uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like a, thank you <laughs> it's like, uh, brilliant brilliant no like this is the thing like i do think sometimes there is a different mindset when it comes from like people who like like my like migrate immigrants comes into a new country look i was like my mother did it like she had that sort of like ingrained in her like she like came over from nigeria to the uk like i was born and raised in the uk so i don't have it in the same respects but there is this sort of like yeah i like i've burnt the boats and i've got to succeed if it don't succeed can't really go back with it's taken so much work it's taken so much effort to get here you know yeah i know yeah i commend your mom it's a I, lot yeah yeah no but like this is the thing america it's a very hard place to get into and you know it's a respect to them but yes now with all of this like you like public like YouTube, public speaking, everything like this. So what made you decide to write a book? So, um, you know, back to the Dave Ramsey thing, that's not a job that he has. You, you can't just go like, I want to help people with their finances and help them learn how to manage their money. What job mm. title is that? There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Okay. Um, what is a financial advisor? A financial advisor is basically somebody who sells stocks. OK, or they are in charge of your retirement portfolio and they take one percent of your portfolio per year as a fee. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're not actually helping you like someone who already has enough money to invest for retirement is not someone who's struggling financially with money management. So those financial advisors aren't even helping people who don't have money saved yet, first of all. Right. So you get that cash 22 there, <laughs> the gap. Yeah. And so. I wrote this book because I kept trying to figure out, I was like, how does one make money while trying to help other people with their finances? 
And when I was going to community college at the time, I was already thinking about this. I was like, if, if this isn't a job, like how does one turn it into a career? And the only piece of advice that people were telling me over and over again, which is so generic, oh, you have to network. And I was like, how, how does one network? How, how do you do that? I don't know how to do that. So I just started like looking for events in the city. And I came across this free event. It's the small business expo that they were holding at the Javits Center. I went there and this guy was giving like this really high pressure sales uh, pitch for this workshop. It's called how to, how to write and publish a book in 40 hours. And uh, he was like, oh, the normal price is $997. But if you buy it today, it's $97. And people weren't buying. And so he's like, OK, OK, last chance, last chance. If you buy now for 97 you can invite a friend for free. So I turned to the stranger next to me. I was like, is this interesting to you? She's like, yes. And then I was like, OK, how about I buy it for 97 But then you pay me back for like $48 or something, you know? And, and then I'll bring you as my friend for quote unquote free. And then she's like, great, sounds good. So I really paid not even 50 bucks for that course. I took the course and then um, they just said, oh, your first book, it has to be something that's easy, something that you know really well that you can like uh, quickly put out. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece, but something that you just put out into the market quickly because you know it so well. What's that topic? And then I was like, I know how to save money, <laughs> you know? So that's why I wrote the book because... I knew how to save money like it was the back of my hand or something. <laughs> and I, I have to ask, was the course worth the money? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> they they said, I, I got to tell you this. Yeah. They, they said, let's set your expectations straight. Most authors traditionally published or self-published, they don't even sell to like 99% of authors don't even sell 2,000 copies of their book. If you manage to sell 2,000 copies of your book, you are quite successful as an author like the bar for success is that low actually if you can manage to sell 2,000 copies um so don't expect to sell any copies of your book you just want to be able to call yourself an author so i wrote the book in 2017 i made no sales no sales for two years <laughs> and then um i made the youtube channel which then took off and yeah. i I started making more videos and then at the end of the video i would say guys if you want to support my channel buy my book leave a review you know other than that i don't take sponsorship so this is the only way to support me and they did buy my book and and leave reviews and i sold two thousand copies of the book so i did it i just didn't do it right away but i did eventually sell two thousand copies yeah i have to say like this is the thing people often like go yeah to be successful to be great in anything it takes so much hard work yes it does but the standard as you say is not as high as many people think because to go oh successful author it's like yeah first thing what comes into mind is oh you must sell millions and be on like yeah the time like the new york times bestseller list if you're not on that oh, 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 you, oh, you haven't succeeded but when you like go oh, 2000 you know, I go. If it, it's not as easy as you think it is, but it's not as much as you think it would be, if you go at me. Yeah, it's doable, I think. I thought it was impossible, but surprise, I, I didn't even look at my sales reports until one, <laughs> one oh. day about like, this, this was in the summer of this year. So this is like five yeah. years after the book, the first book was published. I was like, okay, let me just take a look. How many books did I really sell of that um, first book? I sold 2,000. I was like, what? <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, oh, I, I hit that 1%. You know? So, oh. yeah, I, I didn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, this is the thing. You, like, you've done one book. Like, is there another book living within you, do you think? Yeah, I think I can. So I already wrote the second book, The Five Day Job Search, which is the one I'm promoting now. That's why I'm getting on so many shows. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing speaking engagements at colleges and universities to sell this book. But I feel like I can write like literally a hundred books. You know, I feel like, uh, you know, like the, the dummy series, dummies oh, for yes. QuickBooks, dummies for, I don't know, Windows 10, you know, like those, all those dummies That's books. I want to start something like that, but for finances, hmm. like, like, uh, all sorts of subjects within finances, not just like a general how to invest, but like um, you want how to like very micro topics, how to specifically save for the down payment of a house or like 
how to pick the right house so that you don't make the wrong financial decision. Knowing when to buy the house, you know, like mm. very in depth guide for all of these very specific topics within money that people are struggling with. Because, like, if I just give them the whole thing, if I, I make a very generic big book that's like a textbook on like becoming a first time home buyer, they might feel so overwhelmed or like they're probably only struggling with a few aspects, but they don't know where in the book to look, right? But if I make like really, really in depth, but narrow focused books, they might reach for that book because they know they need exactly that subject. So I could write like maybe a hundred of those or so. Yeah, I think we're like, I think with regards to when everyone talks about finances and like the whole sort of issue and like, yeah, it's such a broad subject, it intimidates people and confuses people quite a lot. Like just from the aspect of saving and investing, you're, you're talking about a million and one things. Uh, if you can really sort of narrow it down, make it easy for people, like, yeah, have their sort of dummies guide for, like, yeah, saving and investing, I think that would, would be a great thing. Because one of the things which always surprises me, the lack of sort of financial education which is provided, you would think they would do this in schools because it's such a powerful thing. If you know, If you know 5% of things with regards to finances, your life could change in such an extreme way. But yet, so many people don't know or have no clue about it, if you get what I mean. Yeah, but I have a, I hold a different opinion. I used to think that way, but I actually think teachers aren't qualified to teach it. You know, as much as I think, yeah, maybe it should be in the curriculum, but should teachers be the one teaching it? Because oh. I, I've come across teachers, like I met one on the train one day, he was talking about his student loan debt to his coworker on the train home. And then I was like, you know, uh, I can help you save money. Like if you want, I can give you some free coaching and, and advice. And then he was telling me that he paid more than 50% of his income in rent. And then I asked him like, why do you pay more than 50% of your income in rent? Like, can't we cut that down to like 30%? Is, is there no way? And he's like, well, because I didn't want roommates. I wanted a one bedroom apartment for myself. And then I was like, but you're, you know, that's not financially sound for your income, right? He's like, yeah, I know, but I like my privacy. So, you know, it's not like a, like, like, do you think someone like that, a teacher should be allowed to teach finances to kids? I don't think so. You know, oh, you don't necessarily just... know like how, how good these teachers are with their own money. And I, I wouldn't trust them to teach our kids with money. You know, I actually, I really think it's a parental thing. Parents should be the ones educating themselves about money. They should listen to podcasts, read books or whatever. And it is their job to teach children about money. It's not something you just leave with the school because parents can also do something like set up an allowance system where like, let's say mopping the floor, $2. Washing the dishes um, every night after dinner, one dollar. Where you can actually instill these kinds of like discipline into the children by tying doing work around the house, as in like work with earning money. You want something, earn the money to buy it. Like, I think it's far more powerful to teach kids in this way at home than it is in the school. Mm. And like this is the thing, I agree with you uh, to yes to an extent, but if that sort of knowledge is not there if you've come from a, like a long household and stuff like this or where people are willing to learn that great it's all fine and good don't get me wrong that teacher on the train yeah no no shouldn't really be teaching finances or anything like this but if you had a qualified teacher who was talking about finances everything like this pretty much like how you've got a physics teacher or like a science teacher just speaking on that one subject, I'm down with that because I think it's really important, especially in this sort of day and age where, okay, we live in a time where, okay, finance is so much, like so much bigger now, but there isn't any sort of real controls because one of the things which when I was growing up as a kid, if I wanted to buy something, I had to count it out and I felt every sort of bit of that coin going out of my pocket to going to get a canned drink 
going to get a chocolate bar, going to get whatever it was. I felt that pain. Today, you tap your card or anything like this. And this is for kids as well. Tap your card, gone. There is no sort of, ah, I feel that transaction. It just happens seamlessly. And if you don't know about the sort of bigger implications of it, you're already setting yourself up for a long line of failure because I, I know a countless friends who get like, yeah, get into it. You might as well just say, yeah, burned, burned their like sort of early 20s, maybe even into their 30s with like, yeah, a mountain load of debt by the time they've actually saw, wait, whoa, <laughs> the clarity <laughs> comes. <laughs> it's like you are going, yeah. But I think that's going to be the thing because look, you go online, it's like, yeah, oh, I can't afford to buy that right now. Now they break it down into- Yeah, with the karma, karma yeah. and after pay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, karma. It, it's all going. And I think that's the reason, like a number of people need that education a lot more, or it's just going to basically, yeah, I think it's going to be hitting people into their, through their 20s, 30s, and if losing that time, sets you back so much so this is the reason why i say yeah they should teach it getting a proper financial teacher in like you have a science teacher like you have a pt like all of that things you know i think so but there's there's also the issue of um you can give people the right information they can still make the bad decision right oh yeah so because this is a, what you're saying with like the tapping the card, you don't feel the effect until much later, maybe 30 days later when you get the statement and you realize you didn't pay, you pay interest on top of that, right? This, this isn't a math problem, but I know the schools will approach teaching it like it is a math problem. In, in Texas where I was, I was actually working as a substitute teacher and the schools mm -hmm. did have personal finance taught in the school, but it was taught by like teachers who, who had this elective to teach as well. Like if you wanted to take the personal finance class, it was an elective that you chose in your senior year or something like that. So it wasn't like this dedicated teacher who only did personal finance for all grade levels and stuff like that. And I, I gotta tell you, the kids in that class, they were, they were so rude, you know? <laughs> they weren't listening, they didn't care. Uh. They didn't care and the teacher, I was there, I wasn't the substitute for the teacher. I was a substitute for the teacher's assistant. So I actually got to see the teacher teaching that class. And he was like, guys, this is a really important subject. You know, when you take your debit card and you go to the ATM and money just comes out, do you think this is like an endless supply of cash is coming out of the ATM for you to spend? No, <laughs> but the kids actually did think that. And he, he even said that he himself, when he was 18 and it happened, he overdrew the account. And he didn't understand until his dad lectured him on what that was. Um, so, but the kids were like just bored out of their minds. They weren't interested. Only like maybe one or two out of like the handful of 35 who were in the class were actually engaged. So yeah, you can, you know, force these kids to learn the subject and make it a mandatory subject. But in the end, it, how well someone does financially, it's all on them, right? Well, one or two, I mean, come on, that's very few. Yeah. I'm not saying take away the responsibility. I'm just saying, yeah, provide that knowledge so they can basically be for, like forearmed to when they go into that situation. Because like, look, look don't get me wrong. Uh, yes, we're much, young, much younger version of myself. Yeah, went into, like, I think everyone goes into it until they get their hand burnt. Uh, it would be like if I was taught about it when I was in school, I'd have been like, wait a second. Oh, rather than thank you very much for this shiny credit card, mm, tap, 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 <laughs> or like back in the day, that's like swipe, yeah, sign. But it would have been a case of, okay, right. What I'm doing right now, it's a case of, yes, I might be getting this cash right now. I'm either super, like, if I were not a Dave, Dave Ramsey, like disciple, it's like, how would I be able to use this in a smarter way or a more strategic way? Or <laughs> don't do that because you will have to pay eventually. And as well as you getting your 
income tax, uh, like on your wage, you're now having this secondary tax of interest on like your credit card payment. Uh, because <laughs> let's just say you're not going to be clearing in full, or if you are clearing in full, that is even a heftier bill when you might not be earning the most amount of money if you go at me. So it's like, yeah. I understand your intention. Your no, I just, this is the reason. Attention is good. I, I also agree with the attention, but sometimes, you know, I thought it through and then I was like, but is it really the best solution, right? I know the intention is there. Yeah. Mm. No, yeah, no, I think it's one of those things where I don't think there is an easy fix to it. And like, this is the thing until like you've got people sort of really sort of taking responsibility uh, for their actions you know what I mean? I think that's a case of that will be one of those things which will be kicked down the road for a very long time. And I don't think it's going to, yeah, until that day happens, we shall see. But <laughs> as they say, ignorance is bliss and there's many a joyful person out there right now smiling <laughs> as the deck keeps mounting. Now, I have to ask that with regards to what you're doing now you may mention that you want to talk about yeah helping regenerate boston like as well as making like doing your book what other sort of goals would you like to achieve over the say oh let's go with the next three to five years no that's that's mainly it i don't have much focus on anything else because if i try to focus on too many things they won't accomplish it right so I mean, I've just been mainly like I need to help people learn how to get a job quickly and increase mm -hmm. their salary so that they can pay off their debts. Right. So I think that's the main thing because we are in a recession. I, I hate that the news still thinks a recession is coming. I'm like, I feel like we're already in it, <laughs> but there's this denial about it. Um, so, yeah, people are getting laid off left and right. Here in the U.S., the stat came out last, no, two months ago, that there were more part-time jobs created than full-time jobs lost, right? So, you know, every time someone loses a full-time job, it doesn't get replaced. Instead, it mm. gets replaced with a part-time job instead. So that's the problem that's happening right now. So I'm trying to solve this problem, which is already a big problem in and of itself. And then there's also, like, the the problem with the downtown area and the retail happening in Boston, which really alarms me. But then there's also, it's, it, it actually goes beyond that. There's this censorship that seems to be happening. Censorship, shadow banning. I mean, these are real problems, right? But they're not given the spotlight for some reason or another. One of them being censorship. I don't know why. <laughs> what know? type of censorship and what sort of, and what subject matter are we talking about? Like, for example, it, go, it goes so broad it's it's hard to describe because mm. like the way i used to grow my youtube channel was through youtube search yes. i would search for what people were searching for on youtube and i'd be like oh they didn't no one has made a video on this topic yet let me be the one that makes the video you know like i saw that people were searching about prepaid debit cards i knew about this subject matter i can make mm -hmm. good videos about this and I started getting views from those videos because I was the only provider of that content. Other people, other YouTubers weren't busy making these kinds of videos about the subject matter. So that was the way to grow your channel. You would look for things that people were searching, but the need wasn't filled yet by another creator. That's not the case anymore. You can do SEO, you can do tags, you know, all you want, um, have the right title. But that's not how the algorithm works to, to make sure your video gets found. It used to be like, for example, when I love reading about student loans, right? And learning more about them. I would mm. go on YouTube. I would search the word student loans. Of course, that's also why I was like, why is this hot woman talking about student loans that pissed me off, right? Um, oh. So I would, I would search <laughs> student loans and um, there would be so many videos from independent small people you know, that, that were just like, guys, I made a mistake. Don't take on a student loan. Or like, guys, I have a student loan. This is a trick that works to make sure it's not on your credit score, and, you know, and stuff like that. Just small people sharing information about their own student loan debt and the things that they learned. Those were all the search results. Today, you search student loans, every top search result, I swear, except for maybe one or two, 
is from mainstream media. It's from Fox News, CBS, ABC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and all of them are about the same topic. They are about Biden's, Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. All of them. They're not about anything else. Maybe like, hey, what caused the student loan issue in the first place? What is the history of the student loan? Um, real stories from real people struggling with them. There's not, it's not that. They were all simply talking about the Biden's student loan forgiveness. And then I'm just like, why? What happened to the small creators? Why are they not showing up in the search results? That's one example. You know, and it, it bothers me that important issues like this are just kind of being hidden. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think has caused this shift all of a sudden? Do you, do you have an idea or a theory? Yeah, yeah. There's a lawsuit that's going on right now. Um, Google, YouTube, they've been colluding together with the, the federal government to suppress information. They work together to to suppress information. This There was a court case regarding this. So, yeah, in, in some way, the algorithm has been hiding this stuff. Look, I, I have 18,000 subscribers on my YouTube. You would think that I should be able to reach my own subscribers with my videos. I don't. They don't get mm. notified anymore. My videos are not showing up on their homepage when I make a new video to my own subscribers. It, it's not because I'm not interesting and not engaging enough or whatever they, they you might claim, oh, but your content is bad. I mean, but how did I get to where I was, right? It's, I think it's, there's something wrong with this algorithm that is just like suppressing important information from, from being shared. Yeah. No, it must be hella frustrating uh, to say the least. Um, and like, apart from the frustrating, uh, somewhat scary because if like, if it's a case of, yes, you do it, like you're putting out an important like message, but yet like the hand of a YouTube algorithm comes down and like hides that message away. Uh, it's like, yeah, how can you feel effective? How can you feel like you're like making that difference to help people on a sort of day-to-day -day basis when you like know that's happening or being like, you know what I mean? A victim of that on a number of occasions um like this is the thing have you thought about like going on say on uh, other platforms uh to sort of like get your message out there yeah yeah or yeah i've been thinking about TikTok. i i bought a course on how to grow on TikTok, so i still have to finish the course and then i will implement with all that i have to do i've been taking my time with the course but i will finish it um but like the algorithm works so differently. Like I, I think I posted three videos on TikTok already two months ago. Mm -hmm. And the way that TikTok works is that they put your video in front of random people who might like it. And, um, up to like 250, if you get like enough people engaging with the video, hitting the like button, sharing it with their friends, then it means it's doing well. And then they'll show it even to more people beyond about the 250 ceiling. Right. Mm -hmm. So easily, even if you're a nobody, you can get started on TikTok and you have the potential to blow up if you're interesting and engaging enough, right? Versus I uploaded the same short to YouTube, okay? So on TikTok with no followers, yes, it gets like 250 views. On YouTube, I have 18,000 followers, right? So I'm, I'm, I already have an established reputation. Same short gets 300 views. Come on, you know? So yeah fine the performance is kind of similar but i had no followers on tiktok so yeah. it's easier to grow i think the potential is there so yeah interesting interesting yeah i know a number of like uh creators like uh basically start mailing lists because of the very sort of thing you're talking about uh so they can basically sort of try to circumnavigate uh that the algorithm by having that sort of like, yeah, uh, one, like one-on-one -on -one contact. Because one of the things I am always aware of when it comes to these platforms, like in a blink of an eye, if like they could say, yeah, we don't, you, you're no longer allowed to play with our toys and just it's gone. Uh, with regards to what I do with podcasting, it's, I would say for the most part, it is immune to that because it goes out to so many places, but it's one of those things, it, podcasting is a harder thing to grow because of that very thing. But yeah, 
I'm, I, I say meaningless, I need to do one myself. So, <laughs> so you know what I mean? But you get what I'm saying though. I get right? what you mean, I do. It, mm. It's important because unless you have a mailing list, it's not your own real estate, you know? Yeah. You're always, you're always building on rented land, yeah. as they say. No, but like, this is the thing. I think with regards to what you're doing and where you want to potentially go, I think it's one of those things which I, it's going to be very important to get that message out there. And like, yeah, like building up. Look, you're only 28 now. Like, look where you can be in five years time, like 10 years time, whew, um, it could be absolutely amazing. It could be absolute gangbusters. And like, look, for someone who's like, yeah, put themselves through an online degree, like move from, like, move from New York to Dallas to be with their like husband, then to move back to Boston to then like, you know what I mean? still make something of themselves applying for 50 jobs a day and getting a job in accountancy with no degree in that sort of subject like yeah yeah you know, i think there's not a lot what can stop you um if you really only myself mind. i'm the only yeah. one who can stop myself i can only self-sabotage myself and i refuse to do that but oh, no. but you have to realize everyone does that in some form right they want something and then they somehow self-sabotage themselves. That's the only thing I think is the sole stopper in, in mm. why people don't get ahead. Yeah, like this is the thing. I think, like, a, how can I say? There is a fear of failure, but the other, like, more perverse thing, there's a fear of success. And, like, the whole thing is, yeah, failing, it's painful. You can learn from it and you can get up and, like, yeah, try again. But if you succeed, all your excuses, everything which is, should be there has gone away. That's so true. I find that more and more true. Mm, so it's yeah. a case of some people don't actually know how to handle that person because look, we all have an idea of who we are to a certain point. But not unless if you sit down, do a lot of self-reflection and everything like this, you can only know yourself to a point when you sit down and go, okay, who am I really? And like you, you'll look in the mirror and you'll see all the good and sunshine and rainbows and everything like this. But in the corner of the eye, you know, there's this dark, ugly part of everyone, which is there, which if you have if you look, truly look at it sometimes like a lot of the times many people don't like what they see in there because the truth is the truth and the truth is sometimes not a beautiful thing the truth can be ugly it can be cold it can be hard and when people tend to look at that they like they won't look at it they will turn away and they will not like face it it's a very hard thing to do. Yeah, you know? I, I know. It's very hard. Yes. No. Now, I'm going to ask one more question before I let you go. Uh, because, hey, I, you're a busy lady. And you, I, feel, I feel like world conquering events are about to kick off in your world. <laughs> now, if there was one thing you could change when you were a kid, what would that be? or one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? You probably hate me for this, but I wouldn't change anything and I wouldn't give any advice. So this is probably one of the worst answers you've gotten, but I actually think the way my life turned out is exactly perfect as it is, right? I mean, yeah, there are bad experiences, but they turned me into who I am and if I had better advice, maybe it would have turned out even better. But the way I grew is because of the lack of advice. It's the lack of advice and the fact that I had to search for advice that helped me become stronger, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, no. Yeah. And like when you say, oh, that's a bad answer. No, <laughs> it's not. Because like this is the whole thing. Like there are many people who go, I would have changed this, I would have changed that. But like, yes, with the aspect of who they are today they might be considerably different it, 
to who they are today and many of the lessons they've learned and to grow and develop would be either lost or they'll be a completely different person like to be aware of that it's strong it's powerful so yeah yeah what to say i i truly believe the way your turn your life turned out is the way it was meant to be what's yours is yours and will find its way to you what doesn't belong to you will exit your life so i always just that's my philosophy if it belongs to me if it's something that is going to be part of my life or was meant to happen this way good or bad i just fully accept it otherwise i'd have too much mental drama going like wishing things were a different way you know that that caused me enough to go crazy and have depression and have to go see a therapist i swear <laughs> if i if i go into spiral into those kinds of thoughts so there's no need for that <laughs> you know no worries no worries at all ah <laughs> annie it's been a pleasure having you on today you have been a superstar uh, to say the least uh, how can people find you out there on these interwebs the best way to find me is by going to annieyangfinancial.com. That's A N N I E Y A N G financial.com. I'm currently promoting my second book, The 5-Day Job Search. So, if you want to get the free audiobook, it's 5 hours long. You can also just go on annieyangfinancial.com and at the top there's a link that says audiobook. Just put in your name, your email address and you can download it. Ah, superb. Go out there, get like get your free audio book and yeah get connected with young Annie here ah get that knowledge down who knows she might be the person who will save the american high street the american downtown area and yeah with financial wisdom as well mm. so Annie thank you for coming on today you have been a superstar you have been great you have been awesome to say the least thank you for having me on really appreciated this conversation ah brilliant Brilliant. And I'd like to say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors, for sticking with us to the end of the show. I'd like to just say, please stay well, stay safe, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic, be all the positive things you can be in this world, and then some. Have a great day, guys. Have a good one. Peace. <laughs> and we are.